Hi there, I'm Dr. Vivian Lowe. You're on VLMD Rounds, a podcast on medical science and tools to optimize your health. Today, we are going to dive into LDL and atherosclerosis. You know the spiel. You go to your doctor's office and they check a lipid panel, or sometimes it's called a cholesterol test, right? And the results come back and your primary care or maybe your cardiologist tells you, uh, your LDL cholesterol is too high and we need to put you on a statin. Because the idea there is that the cholesterol gets into your artery walls and really causes a lot of damage and clogs up your arteries and that's what gives you heart disease. That's the narrative anyway, right? And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have people saying, hey, don't worry about the LDL, no big deal. The main thing is inflammation. So if you keep your inflammation low, and you can do that by, let's say, decreasing your risk for metabolic syndrome, decreasing your insulin resistance, then you're all set and you don't even have to worry about the LDL at all. And then you have the patient in the middle going, okay, uh, who should I listen to, Dr. Lowe? What's going on here? And can you explain this to me? And what should I be really concerned about? So that's why we're going to do this dive into LDL and atherosclerosis. Let's go. All right, the three main things that I want you to take away from today's episode would be, number one, I want to look at lipoproteins, specifically LDL, which is low density lipoproteins, a specific type of lipoprotein. I want to look at lipoproteins beyond their lipid carrying aspects, all right? Because they're mostly associated, the LDLs, for example, associated with the lipids they carry. In the case of LDL, it would be cholesterol. But today, I actually want to move away from that and look at different aspects of lipoproteins that can be very revealing. Now, the second thing is I want to go over what really happens in atherosclerosis. Everybody talks about inflammation, you know, inflammation this and that. And the general discourse is like, you know, there's inflammation and there's anti-inflammation, those two polarities, and that's all we need to worry about. And so a lot of real science gets buried in that oversimplistic explanation, right? So we're going to be a bit more specific about what actually happens in atherosclerosis. And then number three, if it's you know, now we're going to be talking about these lipoproteins, then what would be the real thing that we should look out for to assess our risk for heart disease? What's the real risk and what can we do about it? All right. So those are three main things that I want you to take away from today's episode. Let's start with the lipoproteins. And I have done a whole episode on lipoproteins. So you can look that up. Uh, in the podcast. But just a you know brief review, essentially fats and uh, liquids are immiscible. So we know that fats cannot dissolve in um, water, for example, right? And your blood is kind of like water. So we can't have uh, fats floating around in your bloodstream because it would separate out. And so they need to be transported by these special lipoproteins. And essentially, a lipoprotein is the spherical unit. It looks like, you know, roughly, we can think of them schematically as little balls. And they have an outer layer of a phospholipid layer. And these are fatty substances themselves. And one end of the phospholipid molecule is polar, so it can dissolve in water. And the other end is nonpolar. And the polar end is going to be facing the outsides, right? So it can easily dissolve in water. And the inside is nonpolar, and we can carry nonpolar cargo in there as well. So we can carry the fats uh, like the phospholipids, triglycerides. Um, we can carry cholesterol all inside this phospholipid layer. And then surrounding um, the phospholipid layer on the outside, we have these 
proteins that we call apolipoproteins, and there are different ones that are associated with different types of lipoproteins. Now, these apolipoproteins, these special proteins, they actually help you know, the lipoproteins be even more soluble in uh, the blood, and also they can help with different reactions and functions of the lipoproteins, right? And LDL, as I said, is a type of lipoprotein, a low density lipoprotein. The main thing you should remember here is that even though we have a name for them and a classification for them, we say LDL, right? As opposed to HDL, for example, or VLDL, which are different classes of lipoprotein. We actually don't have, you know, a fixed standard LDL um, particle. And the way you should think about it is when you go to rent a car, for example, you might want to rent a compact car. But within that category, you have so many different models, shapes, sizes, right? Now, obviously, it's not a minivan, okay? It's within a certain size range. But even within that range, there's huge variation. So you know it's in that category, but the different makes, the different shapes, right? They're going to vary depending on the brands. And this is how you should think about all lipoproteins. So the LDLs, even though they're in that class, there's a range in the size. They fit within a size range, but there is variation amongst them, all right? Now, uh, as I said, they've been associated with carrying mostly cholesterol in um, your body. But we're going to move away from looking at the cholesterol aspect. And so I'm going to tell you a story. This is many years ago, I would say more than five years ago. One day, I just happened to be thinking about fatty liver, which is not an uncommon thing. It turns out I spend a lot of time thinking about fatty liver. It's one of our favorite topics here in my practice. And we often actually make fun of ourselves because of the amount of time we spend thinking about fatty liver and talking about fatty liver and reading about it, right? So it was quite a usual day for me. I was just kind of thinking about fatty liver. And as I thought about it, I was thinking about how, wow, it causes fibrosis in the liver and leads to you know, cirrhosis eventually to liver failure. And then we need you know, liver transplants and as I was thinking about this, my mind meandered and I was wondering and I thought, and you know, in the old days, it used to be hepatitis, right? It used to be hepatitis B and C infections that were actually, you know, kind of causing a lot of liver failure in patients leading up to needing liver transplantations. And as I was just kind of almost in a bit of a reverie here, thinking about hepatitis, I went on to think about hepatitis C and I thought, you know, that hep C, strange how it gets carried in the body by lipoproteins. And then I stopped. And then I thought, what it lipoproteins? And I had known this, read it many, many years before, but it was in that moment that something struck me. And I thought, wait, let me just confirm this. I'm sure that the hep C virus is carried in lipoproteins, but I want to confirm this. So I looked it up and sure enough, your hep C virus actually hijacks lipoproteins in your body. And now we have a lipoviral particle, right? And it kind of rides around in that particle in your body and infects other cells with it. And when I saw that confirmation, something really hit me. You know that movie, The Sixth Sense? That's a movie that, you know, I think a lot of people are familiar with. I don't watch movies. I have never watched it. I really just read all the spoilers and that's how I know about different movies. So if you haven't watched it, too bad, uh, because I'm going to give a spoiler now. So in that movie, The Sixth Sense, we have a kid who sees dead people. And eventually he gets to work with a child psychologist, I think. And this guy, you know, tries to help him and so forth. 
And it's at the end of the movie, the very end of the movie, the child psychologist realizes that he himself is dead. And that's why he can communicate with this young boy who sees dead people. And that's the whoa moment for the audience, right? So I had my sixth sense moment when I just read that confirmation about the hep C virus traveling in your body via a lipoprotein. It was a big whoa moment. And I thought, oh my God, I missed it all this time because it's not the cargo. It's not the cargo, it's not the cholesterol. It's the lipoprotein itself, it's the LDL, O-M-G, right? Because the LDL is an antigen, right? That thought just flashed across my mind. It's an antigen, don't you get it? And that's when I just dived into the literature and there was a wealth of information there. Okay, now I have done previous episodes on the immune system, but I'm going to try to just give little brief reviews here. And essentially, we know that when we get attacked by different organisms, bacteria, viruses, and so forth, right, we have two parts of the immune system. We have the immediate acute part of the immune system, and those cells are always on the standby and ready. And if you have any danger or any attack from an organism, then in the acute situation, they're going to spring into action and do their best to eliminate the enemy, right? But at the same time, some of these foot soldiers are gathering information, right? And as they're gathering information, they're processing it, and then they find a way to present it to other cells, right? They take this intelligence and present it to other cells, and now they've given a very specific description of the enemy to these other cells, which are the T cells and the B cells in your body. They are part of the adaptive immune system, right? And so over time, as the frontline soldiers, the innate soldiers, are trying to kill off the uh, invaders, they're gathering this information and presenting it to the adaptive cells. And now the adaptive cells, right, can be very specific. They are going to actually um, target that specific organism to kill it off, right? And this takes a longer time for the adaptive cells to jump into action, but when they do, it's usually finito, hopefully, for the invader, okay? So that's kind of how your immune system works. Now, when bacteria and different microorganisms invade you, right, it would be really handy if your innate cells specifically, let's say the macrophages, right? My favorite innate cell. If the macrophages, for example, frontline soldiers were able to recognize that they're under attack, okay? And they are able to do this because there are special pathogen-associated molecular patterns, P-A-M-P-S, PAMPs. There are these special patterns that they can recognize. And these patterns are actually structural units that the bacteria and microorganisms have. Now, the good thing is that these structural units are vital for the survival of those microorganisms, which means that they can't do without them. They have to have those structural units, right? And so because they have to have them, they always exist. Otherwise, the uh, microorganisms wouldn't be able to survive. And it so happens that our innate cells can recognize a lot of these, you know, structures, right? And therefore, they will know that your body is under attack. So these patterns, these molecular patterns are very useful because those frontline foot soldiers need to know right here and now, those are the bad guys and we have to go after them, right? So it turns out as I dug that in 1999, the famous Charles Janeway uh, actually had a paper on this. And Charles Janeway was this immunologist who really changed the face of immunology. And this paper he published with his protege, Ruslan Mechitov. And it was fascinating because he had won the Nobel Prize for finding these specific receptors on these 
frontline foot soldiers that recognize those structural units in the bacteria. And these are called toll-like receptors. So he won the Nobel Prize for discovering these toll-like receptors that would recognize those structural units, right? And in that 1999 paper, he actually pointed out that toll-like receptor 2, a very specific receptor there, actually recognized something specific in microorganisms, and that was their lipoproteins. You heard me, their bacterial lipoproteins. So all this time we spend thinking about human lipoproteins and so forth, we forget that lipoproteins are also present in microorganisms because fatty acids are really important for the survival of those microorganisms, right? They need the fatty acids to proliferate, to invade, to infect your cells, to make membranes, right? And to make other structural units. So it's really important for their survival. And so they have lipoproteins to trap these fatty acids. They make some of the fatty acids themselves as well, but they have to be able, you know, to carry it around. So they have these lipoproteins. And the other thing is that the lipoproteins help them attach to the cells that they are invading. So it can help them be virulent and, you know, infect other cells. So microorganisms, many, many different microorganisms have lipoproteins associated with them. And specifically, toll-like receptor 2 is very good at recognizing those bacterial lipoproteins. And it's not just, you know, certain uh, bacteria, it's also parasites and viruses that have these lipoproteins. So Staph aureus, for example, very common microorganism that has lipoproteins attached to it. Uh, Borrelia, which is uh, the organism that gives you Lyme disease lipoprotein, right? Neisseria, which gives you gonorrhea, lipoproteins attached, right? And in fact, we can subtype different types of Neisseria by looking at the lipoproteins that are associated with them. So this is well, well known, and there's a wealth of literature there. So why is this important? It turns out that, well, these LDLs, these lipoproteins, right, may be actually seen as invaders by our own innate cells. Why? Because our lipoproteins can get dinged up, they can get into accidents, they can get modified. So if you imagine that if we use the car analogy again, we have these cars on the road, they can run over some glass, right, get a flat tire, they can get dinged by another car, they can scrape against a fence, they can drive into a post, right, they can have different accidents, rear end another car. And so they get banged up and they get modified. And when that happens, right? It changes the structure. And this is going to cause a reaction from those foot soldiers. So as we have these lipoproteins, these LDLs floating around, right? The ApoB part of the lipoprotein actually is positively charged. Now your blood vessels are lined with this gel-like substance, this gel-like lining that we call the glycocalyx. I also did an episode on that so you can look that up. Now this gel-like lining is full of structures that are negatively charged. So let's see, negative charge, positive charge, fatal attraction, right? So these lipoproteins are naturally going to be attracted to that gel-like lining, the glycocalyx. And as they go there, right, they get trapped in there. And as they stay there for longer periods of time, then they get modified, right? They get oxidized, they get damaged with the flow of blood, for example. And so as that happens, we have more and more changes in the structure of those lipoproteins. Some of the ApoB fragments can break off. We can expose different parts of the membrane. And then, you know, over time, we have a lot of these damaged LDLs. They can slip through that gel lining and go through the blood vessel wall and end up in the wall of the blood vessel itself. Once it gets in there, then your body goes, hey, there's something foreign in me. I don't like it. We should check it out. 
and different immune cells, these monocytes floating around in the bloodstream, then go to the location where the breach has happened, right? So they go to that part of the blood vessel wall and they too slip in through the cells and get into the blood vessel wall itself. And at that point, those monocytes become macrophages. They become the innate foot soldiers there. And they go, oh my God, I see those special structural um, patterns that are associated with microorganisms. And that's on your LDL, which is a lipoprotein. And then it's going to attack it. So it will go gobble gobble because one of the main features of macrophages is that they swallow up the things that they are attacking. So they go gobble gobble and they swallow up a lot of these lipoproteins, which by the way, happen to carry a lot of cholesterol, right? Then the cholesterol is not prime here, but it does get involved and can be important in a different aspect. Not going to talk about it now. So gobble gobble, we now eat up a lot of these lipoproteins. At the same time, we're kind of digesting it, chomp, 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 chomp. And then we have different fragments of it that we're going to now post on their special social media platforms, right? And I, again, talked about this in my episodes on immunity. So they have these special platforms that they can post on. And so now that they've chopped up and, you know, digested bits of the lipoprotein, they're going to take chunks of it and post it on their little social media platforms. And essentially, they're kind of making an announcement. It's kind of like a, an ad on social media. And they're basically saying, hey, anyone recognize this fella? Anyone here recognize this fella? And they are now antigen presenting cells. So they're presenting parts of that lipoprotein that they just chomped up, right, to T cells. And they're looking for a T cell that will recognize what they've just chomped up. And inevitably, you're going to get a T cell that goes, I know that guy. I have a receptor that matches what you just put up Exactly. And when that happens, the macrophage or dendritic cell, which is another antigen presenting cell, these cells then go, great. And we're going to stimulate those T cells, that T cell to proliferate right, and form a lot more T cells. And we can have T cells that are going to be killer cells, right? And they will attack the invader. But we have also T cells that will actually help the B cells make antibodies. And now we form these antibodies. And it turns out that some of these antibodies in the acute phase actually turn out to be protective against atherosclerosis, right? And they seem to calm down the inflammatory response. In addition, another type of T cell can be stimulated that we call Tregs and Tregs are cells that kind of are the peacekeepers and they're like the monitors and prefects. So when they come on the scene, they make sure that nothing gets too far out of hand. Yes, there's fighting. Yes, we're attacking the pathogens, but we don't want too much inflammation, too much damage. So everybody just calm down a little, right? And that's the function of the Treg cells. So we have this spectrum of uh, inflammatory reactions going on, right, with some anti-inflammation as well, and there's this balance. And this, I want to add, is a normal physiologic process because we get this happening all the time. We find fatty streaks even in infants, right? And this is a normal process. If we're able to keep the inflammation low and keep the situation, you know, under control. All right, so as I said, that's generally what you know normally would happen in your body. But if you have chronic inflammation and a lot more of damaged uh, LDL particles, then we're in trouble. Because again, chomp, 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 we're kind of gobbling away at those LDL particles. But at the same time, we are presenting parts of what we just gobbled up to the T cells. And I'm saying, oh, do you know this one? Do you know this fellow? And there's a T cell that goes, I know that fella. And then we stimulate that T cell to proliferate. And we make these T cells over time that some of them, again, are inflammatory. And some of them will go and help the B cells make antibodies. But these times, 
this time different types of antibodies, right? And when they make diff this different type of antibodies, uh, then we actually get a pro-inflammatory response. And at the same time, we also don't make as many of the Treg cells. And so remember, those were the peacekeepers. And now the balance of inflammation and anti-inflammation is off and we're skewed more towards inflammation and there's more and more and more damage, right? And so now we have a lot of killing happening in the wall of the blood vessel, a lot of damage, a lot of dead cells, a lot of debris, right? It's a mess. It's a battlefield. And we have a gooey mess. Now, if that gooey mess at any point in time, right, grows so big that it ruptures like a pimple that pops, right? Then all the pus inside goes into the bloodstream, right? And we form a clot. And this clot now, if it clogs up one of your coronary arteries and blocks the blood flow, that's when you have a heart attack, okay? So I just want you to see the range of uh, inflammatory reactions there. It's not just pure inflammation or pro-inflammatory responses. It's all of it, right? It's a big spectrum from pro-inflammatory to anti-inflammatory, and there's a balance. And it's when that balance is off, right, that we get into trouble. And notice all this time, right, the cholesterol is kind of a bystander, a bit of a distraction here. Because yes, you do find cholesterol in those lesions, but primarily who was uh, the big problem maker, the troublemaker? It was the LDL itself that had been modified because the, the normal LDLs that have not been modified are not going to be a problem. It's the modified ones that your innate cells go, uh, I recognize this. I think it's from a microorganism because it's not like the regular lipoproteins that we have in our own body, right? And then it attacks it. And then also it processes the bits of the lipoprotein, the LDL, and presents it as a neoantigen a new antigen, a new antigen, because we didn't really have this antigen before, but because, you know, the lipoproteins are endogenous to your body. But now that you've modified it, your body doesn't recognize it anymore. Now it's a neo antigen, right? And so what does this mean? Essentially, you can think of atherosclerosis as an autoimmune disease, right? an autoimmune disease. And certainly there's a strong association between lipoproteins and autoimmunity. If you want, I'll do another episode on that. Just let me know, okay? Not gonna go into that, we'll stay on track. So we talked about the antigenic aspects of lipoprotein, and we've talked about how now they get involved in atherosclerosis. Then now, what about your risk? What should we look at? So it turns out I told you the contents don't really matter. What matter would be what? The lipoproteins themselves. They are the antigen. So the total number of particles, of lipoprotein particles, is going to be key here. I repeat, that's going to be key. So just think on the road. If you have, I don't know, three to five cars, well, you're not going to have many accidents. You're not going to have much damage to those cars, right? Because it's just a few of them. So the likelihood of damage to them or accidents would be low. But if you had 30,000 cars on the same number of roads, then you're going to increase the probability of damage, accidents, problems. Right? And so the actual number of antigens present would make a difference. So your risk mostly is going to be associated with the number of lipoprotein particles there, the LDL particles, right? Now, if you have very, very, very high numbers, then yes, the probability of modification, of oxidation, of damage would be a lot higher. And that would put you at higher risk for that whole process that I just described. But well, you know, we'll just live and you know a healthy lifestyle and we'll decrease inflammation and we don't have to worry about it. Well, except that life 
doesn't work that way. You get viral infections, you get some sinusitis that sticks around for a few weeks, for example. And then on top of that, maybe you've had some late nights, didn't get some good sleep. Uh, you have exams, you have work deadlines, you have a lot of mental stress, financial problems, right? And uh, you have problems with your work supervisor, you know, maybe some alcohol on board and your diet isn't the best and you travel, you have jet lag and all these things add up, overtraining, right? All these things are going to put uh, some stress on your body. You're going to have increased oxidative stress in your body. So at any point in time, just remember that you don't stay in an anti-inflammatory state. At every point in time, you have inflammation and you have anti-inflammation happening at the same time. And it's a dynamic situation, it's a dynamic balance and it changes minute by minute and it also changes according to your circadian rhythm and so forth, right? So we are not static creatures. We are not static creatures. And so you know, there's this flux going on. So even if you are living a very healthy lifestyle, the point is that there is inflammation going on in your body right now, right? And the larger the number of particles, the larger the number, uh, the probability of modification and damage to those particles, and hence the increased risk to what's having atherosclerosis. Okay, so now what should you do then? then the main thing, as you can see, you got to decrease your inflammation, obviously, right? So you want to do the obvious things, stop smoking, decrease exposure, hopefully to any environmental pollutants, you know, sometimes you can't help it, the forest fires, for example, you just have to breathe that in, can't filter all of it out, right? But you do the best you can. And obviously, you have to focus on your nutrition, and exercise and lifestyle habits, right? At the same time, if you have very, very, very high levels of particles, then just remember that the probability does go up. If not today, then, you know, over the course of your lifespan, the probability is a lot higher than people with much lower numbers. It's just pure, you know, statistics, right? Pure math here. And so then maybe in those patients, we have to worry about those very high levels of lipoprotein, LDL particles. And what do you do? Then that I do treat on an individual basis, depending on the patient genetic factors, epigenetic factors, right? We always talk about personalized precision um, care, medical care, and yet we seem to want a one size fits all for everyone. And that's just not how it's going to work. That's when we really have to specifically make sure that we understand um, that person's profile and then work towards a good treatment plan uh, and preventive plan for the patient. Now, I have gotten a lot of queries from people all over and uh, so I'll address it here. For those of you who want to work with me, you can sign up for my online Metabolic Foundations program. This program was designed by me through years of working directly with patients to find out what works in reversing disease, what works in losing fat and getting healthy. And I based it on the latest hardcore science backed by my years of clinical experience with patients to get the best outcomes for them. So go to tulaversity.com to sign up. I'll put a link in the description. It's tulaversity, T-U-L-A-V-E-R-S-I-T-Y.com. And you can sign up if you want to work with me. And also other ways that you can connect with me check out my website and look out for my live stream events. I'm happy to answer questions and to have conversations with you on lipoproteins, for example, especially the antigenic aspects of lipoproteins, right? And um, that's on my website, vivianlowmd.com, also in the description, and you can check out the events there. All right, I had tried really hard to make this episode about 30 minutes. So I am so happy because I, 
I think I'm close, right? Just slightly over. So I'm going to give myself a little pat on the back. I try to just leave out all the details and just go for the big picture here. And I hope that's helpful to all of you. So signing out now from VLMD Rounds, I'm Dr. Vivian Lo, and I sing the body electric. See you next time. Bye.